Good morning. My name is the Reverend Stephen Ayers, and I am the Bridge Priest at Christ Church, Aspen, Colorado, at least through Easter. Thank you for joining our worship this morning on Palm Sunday. Additional services for Holy Week will be streamed on Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, and Easter Day. Information about the times of the service and copies of the bulletins that we will be using are posted on ChristChurchAspen.org. And now let us begin our Palm Sunday service. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Let us pray. Assist us mercifully with your help, O Lord God of our salvation, that we may enter with joy upon the contemplation of those mighty acts whereby you have given us life and immortality through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. A reading from the Gospel of Matthew. When Jesus and his disciples had come near Jerusalem and had reached Bethphage at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says to you, just if anyone says anything to you, just say this The Lord needs them, and he will send them immediately. This took place to fulfill what had been spoken through, through the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Look, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put their cloaks on them, and he sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and that followed were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. When he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in turmoil, asking, Who is this? The crowds were saying, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. The word of the Lord. The Lord be with you, and also with you. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God thanks and praise. It is right to praise you, Almighty God, for the acts of love by which you have redeemed us through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. On this day he entered the holy city of Jerusalem in triumph and was proclaimed as King of Kings by those who spread their garments and branches of palm along his way. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Let us pray. Almighty God, whose most dear Son went not up to joy, but first he suffered pain, and entered not into glory before he was crucified, mercifully grant that we, walking in the way of the cross, may find it none other than the way of life and peace, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. This is a reading of Psalm 118, verses 1 to 2 and 19 to 29. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His mercy endures forever. Let Israel now proclaim his mercy endures forever. Open for me the gates of righteousness. I will enter them. I will offer thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. He who is righteous may enter. I will give thanks to you, for you have answered me and have become my salvation. The same stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. On this day the Lord has acted. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Hosanna, Lord, Hosanna. Lord, send us now success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. God is the Lord. He has shined upon us. Form a procession with branches up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will thank you. You are my God, and I will exalt you. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His mercy endures forever. Let us pray. 
almighty and ever-living God. In your tender love for the human race, you sent your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, to take upon him our nature and to suffer death upon the cross, giving us the example of his great humility. Mercifully grant that we may walk in the way of his suffering and also share in his resurrection. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. <clears throat> the Passion of Our Savior Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. One of the twelve, who was called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and said, What will you give me? if I betray him to you. They paid him 30 pieces of silver, and from that moment he began to look for an opportunity to betray him. On the first day of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus, saying, Where do you want us to make the preparations for you to eat the Passover? He said, Go into the city to a certain man and say to him, The teacher says, My time is near. I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. So the disciples did what Jesus had directed them, and they prepared the Passover meal. <clears throat> when it was evening, he took his place with the twelve. And while they were eating, he said, Truly I tell you, one of you will betray me. And they became greatly distressed and began to say to him one after another, Surely not I, Lord. He answered, The one who has dipped his hand into the bowl with me will betray me. The Son of Man goes as it is written of him, but woe to that one by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. I would have been better for that man, for that one not to have been born. Judas, who betrayed him, said, Surely not I, Rabbi. He replied, You have said so. While they were eating, Jesus took a loaf of bread. And after blessing it, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will never again drink of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. <clears throat> When they had sung the hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus said to them, You will all become deserters because of me this night, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go ahead of you to Galilee. Peter said to him, Though all become deserters because of you, I will never desert you. Jesus said to him, Truly I tell you, this very night, before the cock crows, you will deny me three times. Peter said to him, Even though I must die with you, I will not deny you. And so said all the disciples. Then Jesus went with them to the place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, Sit here while I go over there and pray. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be grieved and agitated. He said to them, I am deeply grieved even to death. Remain here and stay awake with me. After going a little farther, he threw himself on the ground and prayed, Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Yet not what I want, but what you want. Then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, So, could you not stay awake with me one hour? Stay awake and pray that you may not come into the time of trial. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, he went away for the second time and prayed, My father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. And again he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. So leaving them again, he went away and prayed for the third time, saying the same words. Then he came to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? See, the hour is at hand. 
and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. While he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived. With him was a large crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had given them a sign, saying, The one I will kiss is the man. Arrest him. At once he came up to Jesus and said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. Jesus said to him, Friend, do what you are here to do. Then they came and laid hands on Jesus and arrested him. Suddenly one of those with Jesus put his hand on his sword, drew it, and struck the slave of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Then Jesus said to him, Put your sword back in its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Do you think that I cannot appeal to my father, and he will at once send me more than twelve legions of angels? But how then would the scriptures be fulfilled, which say it must happen this way? At that hour, Jesus said to the crowds, Have you come out with swords and clubs to arrest me as though I were a bandit? Day after day I sat in the temple teaching, and you did not arrest me. But all this has taken place, so that the scriptures of the prophets may be fulfilled. <clears throat> then all the disciples deserted him and fled. Those who had arrested Jesus took him to Caiaphas, the high priest, in whose house the scribes and the elders had gathered. But Peter was following at a distance as far as the courtyard of the high priest, and going inside, he sat with the guards in order to see how this would end. Now the chief priests and the whole council were looking for false testimony against Jesus so that they might put him to death, but they found none, though many false witnesses came forward. At last two came forward and said, This fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and build it in three days. The high priest stood up and said, Have you no answer? What is it that they testify against you? But Jesus was silent. Then the high priest said to him, I put you under oath before the living God. Tell us if you are the Messiah, the Son of God. Jesus said to him, you have said so, but I tell you, from now on you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. <clears throat> then the high priest tore his clothes and said, He has blasphemed. Why do we still need witnesses? You have now heard his blasphemy. What is your verdict? They answered, He deserves death. Then they spat in his face and struck him, and some slapped him, saying, Prophesy to us, you Messiah, who is it that struck you? Now Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard. A servant girl came to him and said, You also were with Jesus the Galilean. But he denied it before all of them, saying, I do not know what you are talking about. When he went out to the porch, another servant girl saw him, and she said to the bystanders, This man was with Jesus of Nazareth. Again he denied it with an oath. I do not know the man. After a little while, the bystanders came up and said to Peter, Certainly you are also one of them, for your accent betrays you. Then he began to curse, and he swore an oath, I do not know the man. At that moment the cock crowed. Then Peter remembered what Jesus had said, Before the cock crows, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. When morning came, all the chief priests and the elders of the people conferred together against Jesus in order to bring about his death. They bound him, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate the governor. When Judas's betrayer saw that Jesus was condemned, he repented and brought back the thirty pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders. He said, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. But they said, What is that to us? See to it yourself. Throwing down the pieces of silver in the temple, he departed, and he went and hanged himself. 
But the chief priests, taking the pieces of silver, said, It is not lawful to put them into the treasury, since they are blood money. After conferring together, they used them to buy the potter's field as a place to bury foreigners. For this reason, that field has been called the field of blood to this day. Then was fulfilled what had been spoken through the prophet Jeremiah, and they took thirty pieces of silver, the price of the one on whom a price has been set, on whom some of the people of Israel had set a price, and they gave them for the potter's field, as the Lord commanded me. <clears throat> now Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said, You say so. But when he was accused by the chief priests and elders, he did not answer. Then Pilate said to him, Do you not hear how many accusations they make against you? But he gave no answer, not even to a single charge, so that the governor was greatly amazed. <clears throat> now at the festival, the governor was accustomed to release a prisoner for the crowd, anyone whom they wanted. At that time, they had a notorious prisoner called Jesus Barabbas. So after they gathered, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release? For you, Jesus Barabbas, or Jesus who is called the Messiah? For he realized that it was out of jealousy that they had handed him over. While he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him, Have nothing to do with that innocent man, for today I have suffered a great deal because of a dream about him. Now the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowds to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus killed. The governor again said to them, Which of the two do you want to release to me? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, Then what should I do with Jesus, who is called the Messiah? All of them said, Let him be crucified. Then he asked, Why, what evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, let him be crucified. And when Pilate, Pilate saw that he could do nothing, but rather that a riot was beginning, he took some water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. Then the people as a whole answered, His blood be on us and on our children. So he released Barabbas for them, and after flogging Jesus, he handed him over to be crucified. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters. They gathered the whole cohort around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him, and after twisting some thorns into a crown, they put it on his head. They put a reed in his right hand and knelt before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. They spat on him and took the reed and struck him on the head. After mocking him, they stripped him of the robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him away to crucify him. <clears throat> As they went out, they came upon a man from Cyrene called Simon. They compelled this man to carry his cross. And when they came to a place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull, they offered him wine to drink, mixed with gall. But when he tasted it, he would not drink it. And when they crucified him, they divided his clothes among themselves by casting lots. Then they sat down there and kept watch over him. Over his head they put the charge against him, which read, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then two bandits were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by derided him, shaking their heads and saying, You who would destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of Man, come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests also, along with the scribes and the elders, were mocking him, saying, He saved others, he cannot save himself. He is the King of Israel, let him come down from the cross now, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now. If he wants to, for he said, I am God's son. The bandits who were crucified with him also taunted him in the same way. From noon on, 
darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And about three o'clock, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Ali, Ali, lama sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of the bystanders heard it, they said, this man is calling for Elijah. At once, one of them ran and got a sponge, filled it with sour wine, and put it on a stick and gave it to him to drink. But the other said, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. <clears throat> then Jesus cried again with a loud voice and breathed his last. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks were split. The tombs also were opened and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. After his resurrection, they came out of the tombs and entered the holy city and appeared to many. Now when the centurion and those with them who were keeping watch over Jesus saw the earthquake and what took place, they were terrified and said, Truly, this man was God's son. Many women were there also, looking on from a distance. They had followed Jesus from Galilee and provided for him. Among them was Mary Magdalene, and Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of the sons of Zebedee. When it was evening, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who was also a disciple of Jesus. He went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate ordered it to be given to him. So Joseph took the body and wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had hewn in the rock. He then rolled a great stone to the door of the tomb and went away. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were there sitting opposite the tomb. The next day, that is, the day of preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered before Pilate and said, Sir, we remember that the impostor said that while he was still alive, after three days I will rise again. Therefore command the tomb to be made secure until the third day, otherwise his disciples may go and steal him away and tell the people he has been raised from the dead, and the last deception would be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, You have a guard of soldiers? Go, make it as secure as you can. So they went with a guard and made the tomb secure by stealing the stone, by sealing the stone. <clears throat> That's a long gospel. Who killed Jesus is a question that is inevitably asked about the Passion story. It's a highly problematic question for several reasons. First, the four Gospels do not agree on the events or the motivations during the Passion. The Gospel of John is notably different than the other three Gospels. Second, the Gospels are at odds with our understanding of first century legal and religious practices and are at odds with our historical understanding of politics in first century Palestine. And finally, we must recognize that 2,000 years of anti-Semitism deeply impact our understanding and interpretation of the Passion narrative. And we need to avoid perpetuating that anti-Semitism as best we can when dealing with this difficult text. Recognizing that these are huge problems and that more learned scholars than I have written volumes on the topic, allow me to briefly address the question of who killed Jesus, first in today's homily and then in a more extended sermon on Good Friday when I will reflect on John's more strongly anti-Jewish version of the Passion. Matthew's Passion Gospel gives us at least five subjects to explore in the murder mystery who killed Jesus. They are Judas, 
Caiaphas and the high priests, Pontius Pilate, Jesus himself, and by extension God, and the crowds who screamed, crucify him. <clears throat> Judas was one of Jesus' twelve disciples and betrayed his location to the temple authorities for thirty pieces of silver. He certainly had a role to play in the events leading up to Jesus' death, but frankly, he was a bit player. Jesus wasn't particularly hiding from the authorities and could have easily been arrested at another time. And while speaking of Jesus' disciples beyond Judas, we should note that Peter, and indeed all the disciples, while not explicitly betraying Jesus, either fled or denied Jesus three times. Caiaphas was the long-serving high priest of the temple in Jerusalem, politically as well as religiously powerful. To maintain his position of power, Caiaphas had to balance the demands of rival Jewish factions who had a history of being at each other's throats, as well as to placate the Roman overlords who ruled with an iron fist. Israel and Jerusalem had been ruled by foreign powers for the better part of six centuries, beginning in 587 when Babylonia conquered Jerusalem. The Maccabean revol revolt of the second century briefly uh, uh, threw off foreign rule, but that era was epitomized by vicious civil wars between Jewish factions, including the Pharisees and Sadducees, who dominated the Palestinian politics of Jesus' day. For six centuries, high priests and other authorities like Caiaphas maintained their power by allying with foreign powers. For six centuries, rival factions would revolt against these alliances, only to create their own alliances with new rising foreign powers. So while Caiaphas can certainly be accused of being an accomplice in Jesus' death, his power was derived from the Roman authority invested in Pontius Pilate. <clears throat> Rome, where possible, preferred to govern vassal states through vassal kings, like Herod the Great, who ruled Israel when Jesus was born and rebuilt the second temple in Jerusalem. Upon Herod's death, Rome divided the kingdom into three territories, each governed by one of Herod's sons. But as Herod's sons were unable to suppress the continuing revolts and messianic movements springing up throughout Palestine, Rome assumed direct rule, appointing Pontius Pilate to be governor. Pilate was a notoriously bloodthirsty governor, who according to the contemporary Jewish historian Josephus, ruthlessly killed numerous insurrectionists. Within a few years of Jesus' death, Pilate was removed as governor by Rome, as his heavy-handed tactics failed to pacify the Palestinian population. To put it mildly, the non-biblical historical record judges Pilate's role much more harshly than do the Passion narratives. <clears throat> I raise the question of Jesus' own culpability, and by extension that of God, because Jesus clearly knew what he was doing and what would happen as he made his last journey to Jerusalem. Along the way, Jesus taught his disciples about the necessity of his death and the importance of the cross. During the transfiguration, Jesus had received clear marching orders from God. Jesus knew that Judas would betray his location to the authorities, but made no attempt to change that location. For all of that, I cannot say that Jesus was trying to get himself crucified. Rather, he was focused on spreading the gospel, even if that meant sacrificing his life. Today, we see doctors and nurses following Jesus' path, sacrificing their lives to save others, just as Jesus did. We do not hold them responsible for their own deaths, nor should we hold Jesus responsible for willingly sacrificing his life on our behalf. 
In Matthew's passion, the crowd seem eager to take the responsibility for Jesus' death upon themselves, at one point crying out, His blood be on us and on our children. This quote, known as the blood curse, has been used for 2,000 years to accuse the Jewish people as the killers of Christ and to justify a virulent form of hatred, anti-Semitism. But Matthew uses the word crowd, not Jew. It is John, who I will talk about on Good Friday, who makes liberal use of the word Jew. I have always been curious how a crowd that had supported Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday could call for his death five days later. The best answer to this puzzle is that there were two different crowds. Those who belonged to the religious faction we now call the Jesus Movement, including many followers who would have traveled from Galilee to Jerusalem with Jesus, would have formed the Palm Sunday crowd, a rival crowd formed by Caiaphas and his faction, most likely the Sadducees, could have been formed to support the kangaroo courts held by Caiaphas and Pilate. The two crowds both represented different factions within first century Judaism. Neither crowd represented the Jewish people as a whole. As Jewish New Testament scholar Amy Jo Levine once said, we note the historical unlikelihood of all the people saying, his blood be on us and on our children. That all of us Jews would say the same thing ever is a tad unlikely. Now this quick review of the prime suspects does not point to a clear answer to the question who killed Jesus. The culpability is diffuse. That's the point. Blaming any one person or faction or people lets the rest of us off the hook. I believe that Matthew points a finger at Judas, Caiaphas, Peter, and the rest of the disciples, Pontius Pilate, and the crowds, because from a theological perspective, they, and by extension, we, all bear some guilt. That interpretation was promulgated by the 16th century Council of Trent and has been reaffirmed by the Second Vatican Council and by most mainline Christian churches. It is human nature to rebel against God, even to the point of trying to kill God. Just look at how hard our modern materialist culture has tried to kill God, to remove him from the public square, and to promote the view that humanity itself is the crown of creation. But the good news of the Passion Gospel and of the Easter story is that while we tried our hardest to kill God, we failed. The really good news is that God forgives us of this primordial sin and still offers us eternal life. Amen. Let us pray in the words that our Savior taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. O God, you make us glad with the weekly remembrance of the glorious resurrection of your Son, our Lord. Give us this day such blessing through our worship of you that the week to come may be spent in your favor, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Heavenly Father, in you we live and move and have our being. We humbly pray you so to guide and govern us by your Holy Spirit, that in all the cares and occupations of our life, we may not forget you, 
but may remember that we are ever walking in your sight. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, you stretched out your arms of love on the hard wood of the cross, that everyone might come within the reach of your saving embrace. So clothe us in your spirit, that we, reaching forth our hands in love, may bring those who do not know you to the knowledge and love of you, for the honor of your name. Amen. Let us remember our friends in the Christ Church community. The family and friends of Harriet Shappet, Bob and Marcia, George, Margot and Keith, Veronica, Bobby Ann, John, Kim, Tom, Bob. For all those serving their country overseas and for those serving all of us on the front lines of battling the COVID virus for the young people and students of Aspen, for the family and friends of Beverly Forsman, for Noel, Susan and Mickey, Petra, Harrison, Charlie, Elizabeth, Jocelyn, Henry, Annie, and Otto. And let us pray for the Christ Church Rector Search. Father, we thank you for loving us and living through us. May all that we do flow from our deep connection with you, at this time of transition for Christ Church and our search for a new rector, we ask for your help in discerning your will and making decisions to strengthen and grow our church to your glory. Help us to be attentive to one another, respecting our individual desires for our church, so that we may become unified in our mission. We pray for your guidance as we seek the leader who can help us to become the Christian community we aspire to be. We offer this prayer in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Almighty God, you have given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplication to you. And you have promised through your well-beloved Son that when two or three are gathered together in his name, you will be in the midst of them. Fulfill now, O Lord, our desires and petitions as may be best for us granting us in this world knowledge of your truth, and in the age to come, life everlasting. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. And thank you for joining with the members of Christ Church Aspen in this moment of prayer and reflection. Please like, share, or forward this webcast. If you would like to support Christ Church Ministry, you can find a donate button on ChristChurchAspen.org. Have a blessed week. Again, we will be posting a brief Monday Thursday service, which is designed to precede your evening meal, and that will be posted by 5 o'clock on Thursday. The Good Friday service will be posted on Christ Church Facebook Live page and on ChristChurchAspen.org on Friday at noon. Easter services will be live stream on Facebook Live at 8 a.m. and posted on ChristChurchAspen.com at 10 a.m. Have a blessed week. Please wash your hands. Find a good face covering when you are out and about and maintain the social isolation discipline necessary to keep your family and the community safe. With Jesus, and with you, we mourn that we cannot be together, but may this time of online prayer help you and give you hope. And may next year we all worship together back in our own churches. Amen.